if you look on the web, people say, oh, you know, testosterone is increased by weight training. You want to do the big, heavy compound movement, squats and deadlifts and chins and things of that sort. But what about the scientific studies? Like what's the actual basis for this? Because if you just take a step back and look at this from the perspective of a scientist, you'd say, okay, what is a squat? A squat is loading up a bunch of uh, weights on a bar and then, you know, sitting down essentially and standing up over and over again. Um, What's a deadlift? It's lifting heavy weights from the ground. Why would that increase testosterone? right? This is what's often not discussed in the weight training or even the exercise science community. What, what would actually stimulate the release of testosterone from the adrenals and or testes? And which one is it? Adrenals or testes or both? And that's often not discussed. But as a neuroscientist, this is the kinds of things we think about because we think always that genes don't create behavior. Immune systems don't know when to be activated. Lungs don't know when to inhale or exhale. Hearts don't know when to beat except for the information that it gets from neurons. The nervous system controls all of that. And so really the answer has to be in the neural system that's related to these particular types of weight bearing exercises. So when you go into this literature, it's kind of hard to find real mechanism. You see a lot of effects. You'll hear things like androgen receptor content, meaning testosterone and its derivatives, receptor content following heavy resistance exercise. And you'll find some examples that, for instance, um, you know, they do muscle biopsies. They can actually see receptor increases looking at either high volume or low volume, really intense exercise. And you, you can find a lot of that, but not a lot of mechanism about how the nervous system would do this. And the reason you'd want to know how it can do it is that you could potentially build better protocols or figure out exactly what about these movements is triggering increases in androgen receptors and testosterone. So what's interesting is when you start digging into the more mechanistic studies, what you find is that heavy weight training. So this is weight training where the, the, sets are done with anywhere from you know kind of one to eight rep range so this translates differently depending on ratio of muscle fiber type and so forth but where basically people are working at anywhere from like 70 percent to 95 percent of their maximum or sometimes even going right down to their one repetition maximum really kind of uh, you know max effort what you find is that using the nervous system in a way in which they're moving heavy loads so that i would translate to recruitment of high threshold motor units for you muscle physiologists and there's a rule in muscle physiology about the neuron recruitment for moving muscles where you basically use the minimum number of motor units of neurons to activate muscle as you possibly can as loads increase you have to recruit more and more neurons it's you always hear about recruiting muscle fibers but really it's recruiting more neurons to recruit more muscle fibers And what you find is that heavy weight training, but not weight training to failure, where completion of a repetition is impossible, leads to the greatest increases in testosterone. Now, I'm sure there are a bunch of exercise jockeys out there that are going to, you know, come at me with a bunch of things where, oh, yeah, but high volume and this and training to failure and that. Sure. Um, If you're willing to kind of put things side by side, adjust for um, exogenous testosterone treatment and all the the rest, which was done in these studies, what you find in general is that weight training with heavy loads, so anywhere from one rep maximum to somewhere in the, you know, six to eight repetition range in males or females increases testosterone significantly. And it does it for about a day, sometimes up to 48 hours. And the studies that I found, which seem to hold the most rigor or weight based on where they're published, as opposed to being published in the journal, I've never heard of it. They're published in good quality exercise physiology journals. Um, there's something about the engagement of the neurons that recruit high threshold motor units in muscle when moving heavy loads, but not to failure, that has to provide some sort of feedback signal either to the gonad to produce more testosterone or is increasing the activity of receptors in the body. Now, why do I say that? Well, this is the puzzle, right? How is it that a particular movement, just like how is it that interacting with your child is increasing or decreasing testosterone? This is the kind of fundamental question at the mechanistic level. And we answered the question for child rearing it has probably something to do with smell and pheromones, although I'm sure there are other cues as well. But there's clearly a influence of hard work at the neural level and then at the muscular level for increasing testosterone. And There's also clearly an effect of working too hard 
and presumably increasing cortisol too much, although I'm speculating there, in terms of reducing testosterone. Now, many of you might be endurance athletes or also enjoy exercise besides heavy weight-bearing exercise. And there are several studies exploring whether or not endurance activity can increase or decrease androgen levels and whether or not you combine endurance activity and weight training, whether or not that has any effect if you do the endurance activity first or second. And the takeaway from all of this was that endurance activity, if performed first, leads to decreases in testosterone during the weight training session as compared to the same weight training session done first followed by endurance activity. In other words, if you want to optimize testosterone levels, it seems to be the case that weight training first and doing cardio type endurance activity afterward is the right order of business. Now, when these are done on separate days, it doesn't seem to have an effect. There is, they showed no statistical interaction, but it seems that if you're going to do these in the same workout episode, that it's move heavy loads first, then do cardiovascular exercise. So there's a little bit of data looking specifically at how endurance exercise impacts testosterone and its derivatives. And it's very clear that high intensity interval training, sprinting, etc., which somewhat mimics the neural activity that occurs while moving heavy weight loads is going to increase testosterone. There's ample evidence for that in the, in the literature. And that Endurance exercise that extends beyond 75 minutes is going to start to lead to reductions in testosterone, presumably by increases in cortisol. But of course, the intensity of the exercise is going to be important too. You know, no one ever, I don't think anyone really believes that hiking for the three hours is going to reduce your testosterone. It, whereas I think if one were to go out and run hard for three hours, that you can imagine there'd be reductions in testosterone by way of increases in cortisol. And so while this area certainly needs more research, it's pretty clear that limiting the endurance exercise to 75 minutes or less, not making it too intense is one way to keep cortisol from going through the roof. But I've talked on previous episodes and there are a lot of others who have talked out there about how to clamp cortisol, how to keep cortisol more reduced. This is also one of the reasons why you can imagine that various individuals, either for competition or just for their own purposes, are rely on testosterone therapy, exogenous testosterone, not just for weight training, but for endurance exercise. So this is one of the reasons why every once in a while, a professional cyclists will get popped for performance enhancing drugs, meaning they'll get caught. And it's not just that they're increasing red blood cells through EPO and things of that sort. Oftentimes they're also taking testosterone, not because they want to be large or have massively hypertrophied muscles, but because they because they're injecting testosterone, they don't have to worry about cortisol-induced reductions in testosterone. They can just clamp or keep their testosterone levels high. Not something I'm recommending, but I'm just justifying the rationale for why an endurance athlete would want to do that at all. Thanks for watching. If you found this information helpful, be sure to like, share, and subscribe for more health and wellness tips.